Hey Noir fans, Jason here from Speakeasy Noir Cast. So when Carly and I started looking for solutions for our podcast, we discovered there were way too many options available. We almost gave up looking for the right fit and came close to forking over a bunch of money for one size fits all type of solution. Then I stumbled upon Anchor FM. Not only is this amazing service free, but we can record and edit our podcast directly from Anchor FM or even on our phone when we're on the go. That alone saves us a ton of money and time. But there are several other major benefits to using Anchor FM that makes it the perfect fit for us. Anchor has a built-in solution for distributing our podcast to all the major outlets, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and just about anything else you can think of. You no longer have to submit your RSS feed to every single service in existence just to get your episode to your fans. And talking about money again, like I said, Anchor is absolutely free. And Anchor FM will even help you to make some cold hard cash right from the very beginning. Anchor FM has a unique advertising platform that doesn't require a minimum listenership. So right out the gate, you can start making some money. So let's put it in perspective. Anchor FM is free. Everything you need to make a podcast in one place, instant distribution, and they'll help you make some money right from the start. So if you've been struggling to find the perfect platform for your podcast, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started after you finish this episode, of course. Uh, you know, where are you at, crew? How's it been, like, reopening? Like, the virus is uh, still around. Um, they don't care about you anymore. So they're like, nope. hey, come back out into society and uh, let's spread this thing around. I how's think, it been for you? I've been in society spreading it around apparently for ages. So <laughs> <laughs> it's no fucking difference. It's just more people. Right. Now you can just, uh, you know, spread it around to your customers, right? Exactly. Yeah. Come inside. Let me spread it to you. And then you leave. <laughs> and spread it elsewhere right because obviously you need your bloody fence paint so sure yeah nope. I mean nothing's going to stop people from doing their, their normal mundane you know normal day life stuff Cle no virus. clearly reinventing your back room is is obviously something you would have done in a pandemic absolutely yeah. why not LED lights flashing lights fucking new paint I've been stuck at home. It's going on. It's it's uh, three months. Um, we probably have at the very least about two weeks left. And there's a lot of housework to do. We, we've done some stuff. I mostly sit around and do nothing. But <laughs> there's, you definitely there's housework to do that I acknowledge needs to be done and don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you identify plenty of stuff that needs to be done. <laughs> Everybody has better gardens than me, right? Everybody is buying <laughs> shit for their garden. No, this annoys me, right? Everybody is like, oh, look at my garden. Look at my lawn. Look at my living room. Fucking look at my living room and look at my garden while I've been at work getting you your <laughs> shit for your garden. Mine looks like crap. It looks like Jumanji outside. You need to start a community garden at your house where the entire community comes over, comes over and pitches in. Fucking yes, please. I will drop the fences. <laughs> please help yourself. Put some fucking daffodils in there or something. Please help me. <laughs> Cut my hedge. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> you should give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to cut the hedges, I will give you yeah. my number. I had just finished doing, well, not finished because it feels like it never is done, but I had just finished my front yard of my house doing all that gardening crap, which is basically pulling weeds and putting new bedding down and new plants and stuff uh, a few days before the actual lockdown. Um, so I was kind of happy about that, that I didn't have to, you know, waste my my quarantine time doing work. <laughs> Actually, <because>. we <laughs> Right. Uh, now I've been able to to spend a lot of time working on resurrection films, doing the podcast with you and you know, some other some other things going on, but uh it's it's been I don't know, it's it's been hectic just sitting around at home. It feels uh feels like a lot of wasted time, I guess, in a way. And and it shouldn't be. It should be like great. Every, nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to have a job, right? Well, I guess most people, some people do. Some people love that sort of like everyday life. It makes you feel completed. I and mean, I don't want to be at work. So if anybody wants to take my place, that's fine. Right. And then, and then you have this like months at a time where like, hey, you don't have to do that. Like it should be the dream. You should be able to go. But you can't because you can't leave your house. Not sure I would anyway, because I hate people. No offense <laughs> to anybody out there. <laughs> No um, offense, humans, but I hate you all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no offense. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, so it's, it's been a challenge. It's been different. It's been weird. Um, sometimes it's been fun. Most times not, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's a different world right now. I'll be curious to see what happens in the next couple of weeks. I know you guys are already uh, starting to open up. Is everything open out there or is it just sort of, are you guys doing the same thing that we're doing out here in the United States where it's like a, uh, I don't know, what are we up to like a five phase process now? I think it was originally three phases. Then they said four. I don't know. What are you guys doing? Oh my God. We're the same. No idea. It's, it's, gone no idea. From, yeah. it's gone from stay safe to stay alert. Mm. Stay alert yeah. about a fucking virus. How the hell do you stay alert about a virus that's in the air? Just be safe, you know, just wear your mask. You no, know, we try can't not be to safe. We're, being, we're staying alert. We, we're not being safe anymore. <laughs> we're being alert. It's like, what? I'm fucking <laughs> dodging the virus left, right and centre. Oh, my God. Um, we've got to that point at, at work where the dregs of conversation, we are, we are scraping the barrel now of conversation. We have a fucking oh. tennis ball that people bounce around. Okay. So and it's kind of like, like a... like a four-hour, like, it's like Wimbledon at fucking... Like, <laughs> oh, little tennis ball. You know, it's, it's the best thing is, it's a dog's tennis ball. It's not even a proper fucking tennis ball. It's a dog's tennis ball that's soft and squishy in case we accidentally hit somebody. <laughs> well, you know, at least, I mean, as long as you're not talking to the tennis ball. Well, Wilson... Wilson will be offended <laughs> that I didn't mention him. So. Oh, poor Tom Hanks. Mm. It's the only son to that. <laughs> 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 All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed our last episode where we um, unleashed onto you our, um, our radio theater uh, version of the curious case of the murder that wasn't. Uh, it was a little something different that we wanted to share with you guys, and we just hope you enjoyed it. And then I know sometimes we get a little off book here when it comes to uh, noir films, um, but we like to have a little fun and uh, do things fun. a little differently. You didn't have fun. I didn't have oh, fun. Oh, because you had to do the that. narrative. I didn't have yeah, fun. Yeah, the narration. That at all. <laughs> That's all right. I'm sorry, anyone I would... that listened to because. <laughs> I, I, I think you had fun. I think you're just embarrassed and you don't like doing that sort of thing. You're you're behind the camera, not in front of the camera kind of I person. I tried right? to do my best posh voice, which is still a like Trumpy <laughs> English voice. So I don't know. <laughs> Well, it worked out pretty well. People seem to like it, and uh, I, I certainly enjoy it. I think it's, I think it's fun. Uh, I've always wanted to do something. That's because you like laughing at me. No, no, not at all. I'm not laughing at you. I just, it's just one of those things where I've always wanted to create something like that, and it's, uh, it's, it's cool that we were able to have the opportunity to do it. All right. So this week we're going to get back to uh, film noir, and we're going to take a look at the remake. I guess it's, it, it'd be considered the remake, even though it's the remake of the remake of the remake. Yeah, but it's, it's actually. I guess when they do sort of things like this, it's it's actually based on the book, not necessarily a remake, because this one is considered the closest version to the book that exists. Um, so not necessarily a remake of Alfred Hitchcock's version. Adaptation. An adaptation of the book. Right. Um and so I've got some stuff to say about that later on. But first, before we uh, get into that, we're going to do our drink for t tonight. And that is going to be a Gibson. All right. And since this version of the 39 steps takes place in London, at least mostly, partially, starting out, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so off. <laughs> and because it's Carly's favorite. Oh, God. This is God. a gin drink. Oh, yay! <laughs> All right. So this is two and a half ounces of dry London gin. A quarter ounce of extra dry vermouth. And two cocktail onions, which I hate. <laughs> What's vermouth? So... Vermouth, Carly, is it used to be something sort of like absinthe where it would uh, oh. uh, it, it would carry wormwood, um, which is, you know, I guess considered like a hallucinogenic kind of uh, thing, you know, for alcohol, um, which, you know, became outlawed. And, you know, you weren't, yeah, cause that's you weren't able to get it. Right. Well, absinthe is pretty, yeah, it's pretty harsh. Yeah. So vermouth was kind of like that, but and it, it's become less of a. Uh, a wormwood um, ingredient and more of a, um, I, I kind of like a cocktail mixer, but it's on the wine side, so it's like a, it's it's a, it's it's a wine. So it's posh uh, absinthe. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's 
Yeah, more or less, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's not exactly a you know a, a liqueur or anything like that. It's it's but it's it's from wine and um, some of them might have some wormwood in it today. I'm not I'm not 100 sure, but um, it's just made for you know it's used for making cocktails and whatnot. <clears throat> so a quarter ounce of extra dry vermouth, two and a half ounces of dry London gin, which is a pretty strong drink, um, and two cocktail onions. Do you eat those little cocktail onions? I don't like them. No. No? No. They, they stole alcohol out of the glass. I'm angry <laughs> yes. at them. They absorb it, right? <laughs> yeah. Put olives in my glass. No, leave the fucking olives out of that. I want the alcohol. <laughs> Take that away. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Plus, I'm, I'm always that idiot. You know the person at the bar that, like, can't... You know when you get the stick with, like, the olives and whatever in it, in a posh little drink, sure. that can't uh-huh. eat them properly because they come out their mouth and, like, roll along the bar? That's, fuck, that's <laughs> right. fucking me. So just take it away. <laughs> I'm going to be a moron in about ten minutes' time, so just take them away. That's funny. Don't need to accelerate uh- the process. <laughs> All right, to uh, to make your Gibson, uh, you're going to add ice and water, which it doesn't tell you how much water, to a cocktail glass to chill the glass. I guess it's just a, you just kind of drench the glass to let it cool off, I guess, so you're not really adding water to the drink per se. Add ice to the 10 side of a Boston shaker in the mixing glass, add vermouth and gin, pour the contents of the mixing glass into the iced tin and serve the glass to the tin. Sorry and secure the glass to the tin. Shake the contents until the ice sounds different, which Carly loves, and the contents are cold. Open the Boston shaker, empty the cocktail glass, then strain the contents of the shaker into the empty glass. Garnish with two cocktail onions, which neither of us like. Do you guys like cocktail onions? Let us know. We want to know. I'll I'll eat the cherries all day. Um, I'll even do the, I love the green olives. Um, but uh, that's about it. I don't like all the other stuff, you know. Like I, I like uh, Bloody Mary occasionally, and I don't know the uh, all the. It's like they put an entire salad in your drink. Yeah, it's I weird. don't want a drink. I don't want a fucking meal. Although I do enjoy it when you go to a really posh place and you have a gin and tonic, and they put loads of like fucking strawberries and shit in it. That's great. Well, you know, it slows you I down, like so you don't <laughs> you don't get completely sloshed. Yeah, you know, not, you can you can eat a few vegetables, fill your stomach. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what it's for. <laughs> um, all right, there you guys have it. We hope you uh, can make this at home and you can enjoy one with us. All right, as we've already kind of uh, let you know, we are watching the adaption of the 39 Steps. Um, this is not a remake of the Hitchcock film, the 39 steps. This is a adaption of the original book. Um, and this is, it's spelt out. There's a, there's a noticeable difference in the title. Uh, the Hitchcock version is 39 using the numbers in this version. The 1978 version is spelt out the 39 steps, which, um, is a funny little thing because Carly had a hard time finding this movie hey. that she likes. Okay. So- <laughs> It's not, it's, I have it on DVD, okay? When I'm trying to search mm. it, it's not my... F- no. Just it's no. nobody else's fault. Just no. <laughs> I feel like it's the people's fault that made the damn film. Maybe. <laughs> uh, here's the trailer for The 39 Steps starring Robert Powell. 1914, a coded cable was sent from a European power to a house in West London. It read, Let the sleepers awake. <laughs> The message meant nothing to Richard Hannay. What do you know of the 39 steps? Yet it would put him... Hannay! ...and everyone who crossed his path in mortal danger. Hannay was involved. If we stop looking for him, the enemy will have a clear field. We must find him before they do. It would make him a fugitive from ruthless killers. And from the law. A human target. He's 
men were chosen as sleepers because they can pass themselves off in any social situation as natives of this country, not so much by disguise as by outrageous bluff. And today, at 11.45, Karolides will be killed. I need sanctuary for perhaps 24 hours. Can you help? And we're looking for our cousin. His name's Hanny. Hanny is neither a professional spy nor an escaped lunatic. He's an extraordinary man with a talent for trouble. And a dangerous secret. For only he can solve the mystery of the 39 steps. 39 steps to disaster. Every second counts in the adventure of a lifetime. Steps by John oh, Buchan. God, here we Buchan? Go. Buchan. Buchan? 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 I don't know. Buchan? Buchan. Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> you tell me, okay? You're the British hey, one. <laughs> I, I'm not Scottish, and he's Scottish, so I'm not going to... We've already been over this. I'm not going to jump well, in you're on closer, that. You're closer than I am. <laughs> I'm going to let say. you take the rap for not saying his name right. That's just how it all is. Right, Buchan. It's Buchan. Buchan. Is that I don't know. What did I say last one? Buchan. What did, what did I say on the original? Buchan? 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 <laughs> not Chan, for sure. <clears throat> All right, so no phonetics. <clears throat> All right, it was the third film version of the 1915 novel, um, and not the last. Um, Robert Powell also, you know, um, I don't know what you would call it. it. Was it was the TV series? Yeah, it was a like, continuation. It was like a, serial, a TV serial that was set before the 39 sets. So it's his character before the 39 sets. So it's like a prequel. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So like when he was like, so it South is sort Africa of a, it is connected to the film though. All right. And that's interesting. Cause it happened like, I don't know, 10 years after, which is pretty crazy. Um, and that ran for one season. It looks like it doesn't seem like it, it took off. And, and I, you know, I don't know that this film was particularly successful. Yeah. Do you know? It, yeah. It, this is a very beloved British film. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to hate me on this, prob- on this probably podcast. Probably British people <laughs> love this film a lot. Um, okay. And anything that you say is wrong. <laughs> Basically. That's how we're right. starting Well, off. that sounds familiar. I'm married, so that sounds familiar. <laughs> You're wrong. I'm right. Okay, so done. <laughs> yeah. Lady Carly and Lady Shawnee are going to get a kick out of this. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. Power right. to the ladies. Right. <clears throat> okay, so. <sighs> Can I do my synopsis in a nutshell? Yeah, I think that, yeah, I, I don't know. We, yeah, we, we can't skip that. You definitely have to do your synopsis in a nutshell. So, I mean, I feel like this is kind of the same movie, but it's very different. So how is it the same of, movie if it's very different? Because it's very different in a lot of bad ways. Oh, I see where this is going. I see where yeah, this is going. And not, and not because it's a direct uh, adaption from the novel, but just from a filmmaking standpoint, it's kind of like a what the fuck? Why did they do that <laughs> kind of thing? Anyway, we'll get to that. Carly, we please shall. give us your super famous in a nutshell synopsis. Okay. So the British equivalent of Jean-Claude Van Damme, armed <laughs> with only his wits and stiff upper lip, fuels a plot to trigger World War One by vandalizing an iconic London landmark. Oh my gosh. Van Damme, really? Yeah. I'd say he's, like, hey, he's he's more like Pee Wee Herman. When he pro- when he's it, more of a Pee Wee hey. Herman, okay? He's <laughs> Paul Rootman. No. He's got some moves. Van Damme. Robert Powell has got some moves. When he's like, oh. we're at chopping people. He's got some fucking moves, man. Oh my goodness. And the helmet hair. Do you know what also I pulled out as well, which you will hate, but I'm going to read it. What? I pulled out my Robert Powell postcard. Oh, good. 
Read it. I want to hear this. Fresh out of storage. I dusted it off. It says... Well, now, I thought this was sitting on your mantle yeah, above your fireplace. Yeah, but I don't dust. I mean, do you really see me okay. as a housewife that dusts? I don't know. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> oh. All right. I, I occasionally move things in the living room that are in my way. And dust kind of falls. Dust falls. I let it sit there. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't really disturb it that often. It says, "Dear Carly." Okay, his handwriting's a bit weird. So hold on. Thank you for your letter and your very flattering words i do find oh my goodness did were you hitting on him no shut up i'm trying to read it's very hard <laughs> to read his very you know british fantastic writing uh oh where was i i do find that unless a script contains oh my lord i should have read this beforehand i do find that unless a script contains wit and no few do these days Obviously minded. <laughs> I find little interest in it. Keep up the writing. Oh my god. And who knows? I may find myself lucky enough one day to be a part in one of your scripts. With the very best wishes, Robert Powell. Nice. Boom. Mic Very drop. Cool. If I had a mic, I'd drop it. I can't drop it because that's what I'm talking into. But, you know, if I could, I'd yeah, drop it. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. I think that's pretty neat. He seems like a cool guy. I don't know about his hair in this movie, but <laughs> well, that was he's a cool that guy. Was his style. <laughs> that was the style. He's the only one with that style in this movie. I mean, because he's a trendsetter. That's I mean, why. <laughs> When people are shooting at him, I expect him to just <laughs> dip his head down and bolts will just bounce off that thing. It's like a bullet hole in his hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's his superpower there. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> ah, Van Damme, huh? <laughs> That's what I went with. <laughs> okay. Well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> so... This movie starts off with a lot of promise. I I loved the opening cinematography and the super foggy London everything. It, it immediately drew me in. I know you hate London uh -huh. and I don't know what it's really like over there, but that's what I envisioned it as. I envisioned a bunch of little uh, Jack the Rippers running around <laughs> in the London fog. <laughs> I mean, not far wrong. <laughs> Not far off. <laughs> um, and that's what I got with the beginning of this movie. I was I was like, oh, this is going to be good. Carly, Carly actually suggested a great film. <laughs> and yeah, then it took a turn for the worse. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Yeah. There is so much in this movie that I found was just. Why would you do that? How? Did they find you? I mean, How are they still do that? following you? Like, I mean, it was just like, I I don't know. It was. And the other thing was, is like, um, so at the beginning of the movie, like, OK, so. OK, so the first two some, minutes, somebody gets killed with a cane. I mean, beat that. Right. No, yeah. OK. <laughs> Beat that. <laughs> Nobody wants to beat that. <laughs> it's like, there's better ideas. <laughs> yes, but, you know, in London, like, they all had freaking canes. So <laughs> make it a murder yeah, weapon. I guess. I mean, and, and you know what? That was the least of the things that I thought was, you know, bad about it. It wasn't. And again, it wasn't that I didn't enjoy this movie. Like, I, I enjoyed the movie. But. I would just come across these moments that are just, I, I, there's just, that's so improbable. Like that to me was just, that's just bad script writing. Are you, you going to knock that, on push bike versus plane? Because push bike versus plane was a great scene. No, it's not, it's not really the, it's not really that, that bothered me. That is like, and then been it done was plenty like of stick times. versus claw. 
there were, there were so <laughs> many verses. Yeah, see, those things don't really bother me. It's the things that lead up to them that bother me. You know, like, like for instance, since you brought up the plane and the bike thing, how did they find him? That's so absurd. They have a plane. He has a push bike. So, so what? <laughs> They don't even have a clue where he would even be. That's just like, that's so random. Like, they're just, I'm just going to fly over this field and, oh, look, there he is. It's like there was no connection. There was zero lead to get them to intersect with him. It was, it was so ridiculous. And that was one of like three times that that happened in this movie. I do, I do like the fact that like he celebrates at the end by throwing his shoe in the air. And he's still got to run stop, across. Stop like, trying to make this good. Of... Stop trying to make this no, good. No, I was, I was don't, siding don't, with you. Don't make this good. You know, it's, <laughs> he throws it's his ridiculous. shoe in the air to celebrate and then has to yeah. run across the rest of Scotland. That's great, isn't it? In the wilderness yeah, no when you've lost a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, guys, we're back and we're going to keep talking about this film. It, it's it's just absurd, you know, when it comes to that stuff. And those are the moments that really was like, is that in the book? Is that in the novel? I don't know, because that would be so crazy. Um, you know, I, I just I don't even know what to say when I when I came to those scenes, you know, when he when he first gets off the road and running across the field, it's like all of a sudden they just pull up in a car like, hey, there he is. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> First off, that could be anybody. Secondly, how the hell did you get there? <laughs> like, what what placed you there in the vicinity of where this man is? It makes no sense. They're obviously um, skilled assassins. Right. <laughs> I mean, just... Russia didn't pick them for no reason, so... <laughs> right, uh-huh. <laughs> it's just crazy ridiculous. <laughs> and then the... the, uh, the the upscale posh family that are like, oh, there's a man running at us in the woods. Oh, let's befriend him. Hey, come over to our house. Hey, why don't you spend the night? <laughs> hey, the cops say that there's this crazy man killing people running around. It couldn't possibly be the man that we just met coming out of the woods where somebody was just murdered. I mean, <laughs> like- to be fair, I went to a bar in Scotland once and they gave me all their top shelf whiskey for free all night. Was it called the slaughtered lamb? It wasn't, no. But, mm, okay. you know, same kind of thing, except I wasn't a murderer at the time. Well, then not really the same thing, is it? <laughs> <laughs> if you came in, you're like, hey, I just murdered somebody. Uh, how's it going, guys? Hey, guys, can I have like, a new hey, jacket? have some whiskey. <laughs> Let's party. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I just felt like there was so many things like that that ruined the movie for me. Um, And it was, it wasn't a bad movie. I thought it was pretty well acted. It had its, you know, it definitely has its moments. What did you think of the the woman? Um, I I thought, I found it ridiculous. She's okay. Okay, because she she was a little girl in Mary Poppins. Oh, was she? Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I didn't think like her acting was was bad or anything. I just thought that the character just didn't make sense. Like it made sense in Hitchcock's version. Yeah, it was. Like, it Hitch- was a little strange when like her fiance got shot and she didn't seem to give a shit at all. Like yeah. poor David. Well, not even that. It's just like why? Why? Like her character has no purpose, really. Like, I mean, as, she, she as did in, like ride the horse and car. Very well. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. It, it basically anything that they did in this movie, Hitchcock did it ten times better. And it's funny because I believe like the director made comments about um, making this film and and how I think he he didn't like Hitchcock's version. Um, and I just I've. I just found that nuts. I found it absolutely crazy. I think that was possibly, though, like a bit of a, I don't know, like maybe a bit of a connection to the book. I think the reason why British people love it so much is because it's the closest tangible version to the book. Even though it's not 100%, 
and maybe that's why. Yeah, I don't know. Whereas they perhaps think, oh, you know, Hitchcock took some liberties and, yeah, his film's probably better, but I think a lot of people sort of have that sentiment of like, oh, no, it's close, because the character of Hannay in this version is much closer to the character of Hannay in the book. So all the other things that happen around it, they're kind of willing to go, I, I mean, maybe. Because the character is so strong. Maybe. I don't know. I, I just, I don't feel like that is enough to say, hey, this is a better film or anything like that. Um, there There's a few things that I was okay. Like, okay, so I know that the, the big change with Hitchcock's version is what the 39 steps is. Mm -hmm. And Hitchcock makes it an organization because it seems a little silly that the 39 steps is an actual 39 steps. Yeah, but in the book, I believe uh -huh. the 39 steps is also a location. It's like a path. Um, to yeah, it's an actual 39 like steps in the book. Yeah. Right. And, and and I I get that. And I can understand in film how that could be uh, a bit silly. I think there's actually a Hitchcock film where there is a film called The 17 steps or something like that where it's an actual staircase as well or it's steps leading up to how I can't remember exactly but I I didn't I didn't mind the fact that the 39 steps was an actual location this and being Big Ben and, and the whole clock tower uh, in scene I, I actually enjoyed that quite a bit um, that's amazing yeah and I wonder if there's some you know, connection to this movie and um, say back to the future, for instance, because that's my earliest uh, experience of like a clock tower sort of scene like that is back to the future. And this had a good chunk of similarities there, hanging off the clock hand and stuff like that, you know, doc Brown and back to the future. So that was pretty interesting to sort of see that. Um, the only other connection that I could think of that was sort of similar in my mind was uh, Vertigo from also mm -hmm. Alfred Hitchcock at the end. It's not a clock tower, it's a bell tower, but it sort of has the same sort of drama, you know, attached to it. Um, so I really did enjoy the end of the film. Um, even the special effects were pretty well done. Um, you know, even though you can obviously tell like one face of the clock is a different color than the other. Um, but it, it was, it was done pretty well. Um, I think it was just a lot of like intermediary, like scenarios that really threw me off and took me out of the film that were just very implausible. I mean, this guy has tremendously awful luck yeah. to have these guys continue to run into him like this. With Hitchcock's version, it was more streamlined and it made more sense that they were on his tail constantly. Okay. Um, plus, you had the wonderful chemistry and drama between the the you know the lead female and the lead actor that played you know, but it, it, this didn't have that like. But again, I I think that's leading to the book because I mean. I'll be honest, I've only read um, half the book. I actually found it mm. on uh, Google where you can read it for free. Um, nice. And there, I, as far as I'm aware, there wasn't a massive love interest in the book. There was no reason for any love interest to ever be there. So yeah, I've read that, that there was no... Hitchcock yeah, there was no love interest. did yeah. that better by creating the chemistry and the tension... Uh, for a potential love interest, but obviously because this version was trying to stay closer to the book, that's perhaps why it was a little bit forced, I would say. It felt a little bit forced. Um, they didn't They didn't really have any connection to, to entwine. They didn't really have any connection to stay entwined. They didn't really have any connection afterwards. They didn't have any chemistry during it. Um, well, not to mention that, that they made Hannah. her married. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess for the 70s, maybe that wasn't like a huge deal, but that's like, I mean, right off the bat, why make her married? I mean, if you really want to have a good love interest, you know, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have done I that. Love I the think fact, that was though, just... that at the end, that little snapshot of them having been together and got married. She's wearing a fucking Mary Poppins outfit that she wore. When she went off on a jolly holiday with Bert. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. She's wearing pretty much exactly the same outfit. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the stuff like that is definitely fun. And and he is as well. Like, that's quite funny. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I just I I feel like sh- her character is definitely or the, that being a love interest sort of thing is definitely forced. Mm. I mean, and they end up killing her husband uh-huh. or whatnot. And I mean, all that was fine, but it's just I don't, I don't like those sort of things where it sets up sort of a. Uh, you know, you introduce a character and it kind of breaks up a happy marriage. Yeah, I think there was no emotion there. Like there was, there was nothing there. Even if there yeah. was, it that sort of stuff still bothers me. I, I mean, why can't we have like a happy marriage in a movie without there being that sort of infidelity or that idea of possible inf- Like, I just don't like that. Mm. Like, it's just, it's just in too much stuff. You know, it doesn't need to be in everything. It's like, come on. Um, so, I mean, in it, it, it just didn't feel like it mattered. Like it didn't like there was, it just didn't matter. We didn't need that at all in this movie. Uh, but you know, again, at the time, I guess they just, you know, you have to have a love interest in a movie, whatever, but it didn't help the movie at all. That with, um, all of the crazy, you know, bad guys on your tail that come out of nowhere and have absolutely no idea where to find you, but still do anyways, (laughs) stuff just really bothered me and made it a, a tough, like, watch to to really enjoy because every time that would come up i'd be like oh my god this is so bad and then it would like do something that was fine and it'd be like okay this is a good movie oh my god that was so bad <laughs> you know, and it would just go back and forth like that and it's just like you know come on guys either they didn't take enough time to like really finesse the script and and try to find a logical way to bring those bad guys in and they're just like, well, let's just have him show up. No, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did love the scene though, where he's like been completely like catatonic, and he's trying to get out the room, and then ends up just like completely destroying a hallway in a hotel in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. You're like, no, no. <laughs> it's a. It's all right. <laughs> it was. It's fun. It's a fun scene. I, I don't. I don't have a problem with it. But it, there's. It's. Yeah, I mean, I could pick it apart too. I don't, I don't want to do that, but I could, I could totally pick that apart. There's a better way to do it, but it was fine. I mean, that kind of stuff didn't bother me as much as the as the bigger things I've I've talked about. But, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, the the biggest the biggest piece of comedy in this movie that I noticed, and I'm going to bring this up, Carly, because of you particularly. Why? What did I do? I'm okay, so a while back on one of our episodes, you freaked out at the notion of putting soda <laughs> in a drink. Okay, now, now, me being American, I have no idea what you uh, lovely folk do over in the UK. I don't hey, know. What we're the, not lovely. <laughs> what the things are. Oh, hey, I don't even know that. You're certainly <laughs> lovely. I don't understand, like, the differences of the dichotomy of, like, your guys's world <laughs> but you freaked out at the notion of adding soda to a whiskey uh-huh. or a drink whatever it might be and being as this film is very british as you've pointed out <clears throat> plenty of times i laughed at the top of my lungs and fell out of bed when he asked for a whiskey and soda I was like, what in the okay. hell is happening? So, not okay. British this is 1978. This, not you, weren't even, you weren't even born yet. And that was a thing to have whiskey and soda. British people made that, not <laughs> and Scottish people. And you're telling people. me that you never even heard of it. And this is oh, one no, of your favorite no, no. movies. I said that I heard of it. Like, I said that I didn't ta- like it. I didn't agree with it. It's an abomination. A, hey, you know what? Is what I said. I'm going to go back and I'm going to find that episode and I'm going to insert it here. And, I'm, and we're going to show people exactly what you said. Yeah, because <laughs> this is what happens when British people have a Scottish novel and think, oh, I can do that. <laughs> oh, now you're blaming it on the yeah. Scots. So you're going to blame it on them that they got your culture wrong? <laughs> no, the English people got <laughs> now the that's Scottish assuming. culture wrong. It is a Scottish book set in the freaking Highlands. Written by a Scottish person. So you're saying, so, okay. So you're blaming the Scottish people on the fact that British people think that Scottish people drink whiskey and soda. I believe so. Is that what's happening? That is convoluted. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what you originally said I am here. still not but, going to the Highlands of Scotland and putting soda in shit. Never. <laughs> you don't have to. You could do it straight from home. Never. Uh, if you want to go, you I, go, Lord Morris. You go to fucking Glencoe <laughs> and you ask for 
You ask for some whiskey with some soda water. Crack on. That's what we're going to put on our little yeah. patch of land is a That's little mini bar. That's where you're going to die. <laughs> on that fucking patch of land when you ask for that. It's so small, we'll have to be buried straight up and down. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just, I laughed so hard when that came up. I, I couldn't wait to bring Don't that up. Don't worry, I'll get you a nice little memorial of like a, like a stick or something. I'll put a stick there. Like, <laughs> here lies Lord Morris. He asked for soda water with whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> just a bottle of bur- bur- bourbon just sitting <laughs> I'm right there. I'm not putting that crap fine. on your grave. Fuck off. <laughs> 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 oh, but I thought it was so funny. It was so hilarious. Um, I I think overall this this movie, like the way it plays out and everything, is pretty similar to Hitchcock's version in terms of um just the structure, the the idea. But it's all pretty much the same. It's just they just tweak things to make it their own. Uh, you know, took things out, changed them a little bit, whatever. It's it's still basically the same film. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still about assassination plots and, you know, trying to, you know, get the information to the proper people and not get killed in the process and being, ch- you know, it's all, it's all pretty much the same, but, um, the things that they did better in this film, I think, um, made a lot of sense and, and were enjoyable and the things that they didn't do well, I, I think are, are just glaring enough to make the film, um, falter quite a bit and and that really sucks because if they had spent more time I think on the script in those pieces or at least had realized that these guys aren't going to find him in the middle of nowhere like that and maybe sprinkled a few extra clues in there it would have made more sense it would have made it way more enjoyable for me and wouldn't have taken me out of it um, so overall I wish I had liked it as much as you did but unfortunately I did not mm. so Do you have anything left to say about this wonderful, wonderful Robert Powell film before we uh, rate it? It's amazeballs. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's a lie. I mean, it's not because I'm a lady. (laughs) (laughs) Lie, lie, lie. It's no lies. It's not lies. lies. Read the book. Read the damn book and come back to me. I'm going to have to. Read I, the I damn really book. am. I mean, yeah, we're two versions into this well, you're story. Gonna have to I'm going to have to read the book. The Kenneth Moore one as well now. Right. And, and the TV yeah. series. I'm going to have to see the prequel. Let's let's see how this all ended up being this way. We're too far into it to, to back out now. <laughs> I, I can't when, when you told me that it's a prequel to the 39 steps, it made me just kind of say, what the fuck? <laughs> How could Hanny, Hanny, Hannah, Hannah, Hey, Hannah, Hey, whatever his name is. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> how, <laughs> how could he be involved in anything related to this story prior to it? The whole idea is that he's yes, just the secrets guy went to him because he was like oh you're a secret spy who can obviously like keep my secrets Duh. nah yeah but it doesn't I, it just doesn't have anything to do with this though no but obviously you realize like you're a scoundrel i'm a scoundrel let's be scoundrels together mm, i guess i don't know far-fetched to me but I, I do want to check that out. I do want to watch the other versions. I do want to read the book. We'll see what, what time allows. <clears throat> okay, so here we are. We're going to rate this. Carly, I want to hear no, your ratings you first because first. I know it's going to be amazing. No, no, you go first because your rating is going to be no, rubbish. No, you go first. No, well, my rating is obviously going to be amazing. Gonna be, so Mine's going to be amazing and honest. <laughs> Yours is going to be amazing and false and not honest. <laughs> <laughs> Biased. <laughs> Thank you so Bias much. British ratings. No, you go first. I demand. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. I'm okay. So listen, again, I don't like trashy movies and this movie has its moments. Like there's definitely some good stuff in here. It's worth watching. You're already backtracking. I'm not backtracking. I'm giving my honest opinion here. Uh, there, this movie is worth watching. I probably wouldn't own it. <gasps> I wouldn't seek out to buy it. I, it didn't make me a fan of anybody involved in the movie. Um, 
including Robert Powell. Like everything is serviceable. Like I think everybody, the acting's decent. The cinematography in certain spots is, is really great. Um, but it was like, I, I just, it fell flat in too many areas. Even, even with the, the great, uh, set piece at the end with the clock tower, the big Ben and all that kind of stuff. Even as awesome as that was, it wasn't enough to, to make me love this film. Um, and ultimately I'm going to give it a five out of 10 gens what? because five out of 10. yeah, five. Yeah. I wouldn't really? watch this again. This was I worse than yeah. That draft. Yeah, oh, it was because man. at least that, yeah, it was at least that it, at least that made sense. I mean, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you can't have a movie like this and just have people just pop up with no. I mean, it's not a sci fi movie. There's no GPS. They can't track him. I mean, maybe like, they could. He's in. The, he's no. He's literally in the middle of fucking nowhere and nowhere. Oh. And they just drive up in a car like, oh, there he well, is. They have a plane. They have a plane. <laughs> the plane wasn't even introduced yet. <laughs> Like that didn't make any the plane, sense. The like, plane, they have the plane. <laughs> okay. Yes, you're right. This is like Fantasy Island. <laughs> you got it. That's how it makes sense. <laughs> no, it's it was it's too way too far. The script is just in, in places. Again, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of, of moments that are great in this film. Uh, are good, I would say, not great, but there's too many scenarios that are just that is not going to happen. It just takes you out of the story. It's just ridiculous. And, and it just, it, it wasn't necessary. They shouldn't have done that. Like somebody had to have stepped in and been like, Hey, how the hell did these guys find him? You know, it's something as simple. That conversation needed to happen, you know, unless I'm just too dumb and I don't, I missed that. I miss a clue, a plot. Is there something there that I just freaking missed? I think so. Well, you tell me, did I admit, how did they find him? And don't tell me the plane, because the plane didn't show up yet. You sort bulls, basically. <laughs> Carly, you're taking this hard. I am, because my rating <laughs> is 10 out of 10. Yeah, I figured. I mean, you're you're acting like I just, you know, Spat crapped all over child. a guy Pierce. Yes, that's how I'm reacting. <laughs> all right, well... Yep, five out of ten, and that's 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 a generous five. Wow! Yeah, you're really gonna do ten out of ten there on I this? Am. You really? Yeah. How? Well, you yeah, know it's false. You hey, know that there's issues, right? When somebody dangles off Big Ben, that's a ten out of ten. All right, so you're telling me that Back to the Future is a ten out of ten with you yeah, as well? Hundred percent. All right. When you dangle right, off well, Big I mean, Big Ben. And you stop the hand from clicking over. That's a freaking 10 out of 10, man. When people are shooting at you, <laughs> after everybody's yeah. told you you're crap and you still dangle off it, no, no. And yeah, then I mean, it's a good you ending. go back yeah. onto a boat and kick, you know, somebody in the head. Oh, no. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <sighs> Yeah, it, it is kind of like Pee Wee Herman being in an action movie. My my ten is based on it's a very closely accurate version of Hanny, the character of Hanny, mm-hmm. from what I've read. Yeah, he uses so his intellect we- more. Okay, his uh-huh. hair maybe up for discussion. <laughs> However, still manages the charm of wanting to fucking marry him. So. 10 out of 10 there. Uh-huh. <laughs> Dangles off Big Ben. Okay. Foils the fucking plot. All right. So how, how what, what makes this movie noir to you? Like, what, where do you, where does the noir come in in this film? Is it, is it noir? Um, see, I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily say that this version is noir. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that this version is uh, a film noir per se. I think it's one of the grey area films where people would class it as that. However, it it 
probably isn't. Yeah, I, I definitely call this a thriller film. Yeah. I don't think it's noir at all. Uh, the only the only resemblance of noir to me is the beginning stuff, the opening, which isn't really. It's more espionage feeling than noir. It definitely has like a. It's not even really the lighting. It's really all the damn fog. It's like almost impossible to see anything and, and it builds the tension. So it's really not even noir I, I there. I think the reason why I mean, it's, it's kind of classed as film noir is because people say it's a remake of Alfred Hitchcock's version. Right. Which yeah, it, we know which it isn't. It isn't. Yeah. It's an adaptation, yeah. but it's still kind of like bunged into the category of film noir. So in that case, I lied to everybody at the beginning of this podcast because I told you we're getting back into some noir stuff here. And we absolutely did not do that. My apologies. Really? I didn't mean to lie to you. I'm, I'm just I'm just a jerk. Yeah, he is because you know? he gave it five out of ten. <sighs> yeah, I did. Well, <clears throat> that that was me being, you know. Nice, because I'm letting you guys know what you're in for if you decide to watch this film. Uh, good luck. Um, good luck. Hey, <laughs> you made me watch a film about a bloke that just wants to go to sleep. Yeah, I mean, he just wants to get better. I mean, he just wants to go sleep and get better from his back problems. Yeah, so he can open a farm and yeah. farm with his buddy. And I'm pretty sure you gave it a better rating than this. I think I did. A man who foiled yeah. a fucking espionage plot. Yeah. To start World War One, yeah, un- unlikely to happen because you know, well, not unlikely. I'm sure he would have definitely been able to foil it because those damn people would not have ever found him. <laughs> and I don't think he would have ran across the countryside with one shoe. Well, he only did that towards the end of the film, so it was, it was he was limping. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, too much craziness. Too much craziness in this one. Yeah, I don't know. If you're watching a movie that is suspension of disbelief, whatever, um, and it's sci-fi or horror, it's like I can get behind that. But when you do something that's like really grounded in reality, like a thriller film, it's much, much harder to buy stuff like that, you know. So it it really takes me out of the story because I want to when you're watching a thriller like this, you you really want to be invested in that lead character. He's truly like the anti-hero, the you know, that guy that just gets thrust into the stuff. And then when ridiculousness stuff like that happens, it's just they would never have found him. It's just, you know, whatever. I'm going to keep saying that because it's starting to bother me. I'm saying it so much. So I'm just going to stop talking. now. <laughs> and this episode is now over. <laughs> Now, anyway, you guys know how we feel about it. Check it out if you must. Hey. Uh, if you're a 39 Steps completist, <laughs> or I guess if you're Check British. It or s- <laughs> Check it out. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead and, and give it a look. But uh, I, I uh, put myself through the torture so you didn't have to. I'm going to tell Robert Powell you said that. It's nothing yeah, against I'm him. Tell him I mean, you he's, said that. he's totally fine in this. Um, I, I'm sure this, you know, wasn't the greatest movie he's been in. It can't be. I hope it's not. Um, but we'll see. So anyway, I hope you guys uh, don't enjoy that film and uh, you do enjoy the podcast. And um, I guess we will see you on the next one. Bye bye. He's looking at you, kid. this week on the speakeasy noir cast make sure to visit our website resurrectionfilms.net where you can subscribe to the show on itunes stitcher or any of your favorite podcast apps so you'll never miss a show while you're at it if you found value in the show we'd appreciate a rating on itunes or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show that would help us out too if you like the show you might want to check out our book the dark side of acting up available now on amazon or you can check out one of our films available on amazon prime